Got that first part? Here's part two. Back to part one. Thank you all for joining us. That's called Nigun Tishrei. Nigun Tishrei. Hard to believe we're still in the month of Tishrei here of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeret, Shemini Atzeret, Simcha Torah. At some point, you know, you tell a Gentile you're, that yeah, as a Jew, you're still observing a, a holiday. They think you're lying. They say, are you kidding me? You're making these up at this point. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, I heard of that. Okay, Yom Kippur, everyone's heard of that. Sukkot, oh, you're going to do what with a hut in the backyard? Now they're Shemini Atzeret, what? You got, you want, you want Simcha Torah, they're, they're going to send the student to the dean. They'll say the, the kid's lying about why he's not attending school. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fun month. It's a fun month over here. And then comes uh, Mar Cheshvan. So then we have a little uh, dryness of holidays. So friends, thank you for joining us. And I'm looking forward to discussing human dignity together. And this is a very, very rich topic. Um, and uh, as always, feel free to put some thoughts into the, or questions into the chat on the side uh, while I'm talking. And then after uh, I'm, I'm done sharing a little bit, we can move towards a, uh, a Q&A conversation mode, which is always my favorite to hear what you're thinking and uh, where you want to push back, where you agree, whatever the case is. Okay, so the obvious starting point is where we're going to be in a week because Simchat Torah is this weekend. We're going to be back at Bereshit. Right at the beginning of Genesis, it's the most famous idea in Jewish thought. Genesis 1.27, God created humanity in God's own image. In the image of God, God created them, male and female, God created them. So this in Hebrew, as you know, is called the Tzelem Elohim, that humans are created in the image of God. And here there's great debate around what dimension of the human, of the human being is actually godly, is godly. Some say it's our capacity for reason. Some say it's our capacity for speech, human speech. Some people think it's our moral reasoning, our ability to, to reason. Others think it's the soul, that humans have a soul. And um, some actually go as radical as to say that humans in some way physically resemble God. Maimonides would hate that. Maimonides thinks God is, uh, um, that it's actually a principle of faith to understand that there's no physicality to, get to God. Um, and so, the, but the Hasidic teachers and the Kabbalists would be just comfortable, just fine with that. So the notion of the body. Others will suggest it's an idea of freedom. God is absolutely free. And so we as humans are godly in that we are free. Now, perhaps most interesting, rather than godliness being an adjective um, or a noun, is the idea of God as a verb. The idea that um, we do we do godly, we do godly, right? When we do an act of love, an act of compassion, that's kind of where God exists in, the, in that space of action, um, rather than merely a sentiment of the heart or an attribute of our lives. Uh, nonetheless, those are the main ideas as to Tzalem Elohim. Now, he, now, here's a cool idea I saw recently in, uh, from a Hasidic teacher, where, where he basically um, asks the question, um, uh, Aren't the psychologists right? By psychologists, he kind of means Freud, the early psychologists. Um, aren't they right 
God is just a projection of our human experience, right? Obvious, right? Um, we, right, more than, than humans being created in the image of God, God is created in the image of the human, right? And so um, this is uh, an argument for atheists. But the Hasidic teachers spin it. They spin it, and they say, exactly. Humans do construct an image of God, but it comes from within our own image of God. From within our Tzalem Elohim, we construct an image, and thus the projection itself is true because of where it emerges from, which is kind of a radical pluralism that says that all of us have different visions of what, God, what, what, what divinity could be, but that emerges from our own divinity. Now, this is very interesting because panentheism suggests that God is within everything, right? This, this is why actually the notion of a Hindu bow, bowing to a statue is not so absurd, right? To, to many monotheists, it sounds totally crazy and absurd. What, the statue is God, give me a break, right? But once you think God is within everything, then the notion of worshiping through anything can make sense. The idea that there is only God and there's godliness in everything, and thus anything I worship through brings me back there. So if that was true, then to what extent is the godliness of a human being any different than the godliness within a snail, within a snail, or within your your, your, uh, your seltzer, or within like your shoe, right? We'd like to think that human dignity means humans are something more lofty. And so that raises the question of where does God reside in the world? And what, what are the implications for human dignity? Now, here's what it says in Bereshit Rabbah, 3414, Genesis Rabbah, the, the Midrash from the rabbis. One who sheds blood is regarded as though they had impaired the likeness of God, Demut, the Demut Elohim. Why? Because Genesis 9, 6 says, for God made humans in the image of God. So over there, it directly links moral responsibility to this spiritual affirmation, right? Because there is um, image of God, then if you shed blood, um, you've actually removed godliness from the world. Judy writes over here, we bow to the Torah, it's not a huge step for a Hindu to think that a Hindu God is represented in his idol. Right, great. Uh, now, I don't think there is any Jew who bows to the Torah thinking that the Torah is God. Um, I, I, you know, even the most radical of, of this type of Jew or that type of Jew, but I've never heard anybody think the Torah is God. Um, whereas the Hindus really do believe the statue is God. It's not, it's not even a channel. It's not a representation. It's not a message. It's not a book. It is God. Now, if you ask the Hindu cab driver, I've been to India. If you ask the Hindu cab driver, I asked every cab driver in India I talked to, uh, uh, if, uh, if, the, if there are multiple gods, they say, yes. What do you mean? The elephant is God and the statue is God. There are multiple gods. But if you ask the Hindu academic, they will tell you that there is a unity. There is a unity to all of that. There's a, a Godhead, as they would say. Uh, there is a oneness to all of it. So some actually argue that Hinduism in its most intellectual form is actually monotheism. But no doubt for the layperson practicing Hinduism, it is a polytheism. In any case, J Judy's point is helpful because the idea of, of worshiping, the idea of something being holy or sacred, such as like a Torah scroll, that we treat as something elevated, um, is something that can help us understand this idea of more holy objects. There are people who really feel something at the Western Wall, at the Kotel in Jerusalem, and people who don't. And um, this actually shifted for me. The way that I shifted was with the Western Wall was not that this wall is inherently holy because there was a Beit HaMikdash, a temple here, and I want another temple. And so this wall represents the temple I want with animal sacrifice and the Kohen Gadol, the priest to come serve here. That, because that didn't work for me. What worked for me was the history. History, centuries of Jews, centuries of human beings have stood at that wall for um, really millennia, to, for two millennia, um, praying. And, and others praying towards that wall, right? We think about praying east, but of course, if you're in Jordan, you pray west. If you're in Eilat, you pray north. If you're in the Galilee, you pray south. You pray towards the wall. Right, and so um, the idea of it being a space that has contained that history, that history and that presence is itself, I think, something uh, I find to be powerful. Of course, let's get beyond the politics for a moment, if we can, of uh, who's included and who's excluded at the wall, which is uh, something that I imagine most of us are on the same page with as well. 
the accessibility issue on many levels. It's not just a gender issue. It's also, they recently banned a seeing, they, they banned seeing eye dogs. What the blind guy wants to come to the hotel with his seeing eye dog is, oh, it's not fitting to have a dog here. Whoa. That, um, I was very disturbed by that. I don't know if they changed that or not. Anyways, so um, this idea of objects having kedusha, holiness, and sanctity, and how we treat them differently, and how we think of the human life. Okay, so here's what it says in Tehillim 8.5, in the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verse 5. You have crowned humanity with glory and majesty. The Hebrew is kavod vehadar ta'atrehu, right? Humans have been crowned with glory, in a sense, right? Because we have this gift of being created in the image of God, and thus we have kavod habrio, the, the, the honor of being hum humans. So what does that mean? It says in Pirkei Avot 611, the, the ethics of the ancestors, all that God created in the world was created exclusively for God's glory. So this is about God according to, according to that source. And so our dignity is the glory of the divine. That's to say, to shame a human being is to shame God. To say a person is ugly is to offend the divine creator, right? To hurt another is to hurt the creator. Because I'll tell you, for me, much worse than somebody trying to shame me is someone trying to shame my child, right? You shame my child and I feel the pain much more, right? And so, um, so too, if we thought of it that way for God, if someone says, oh, I don't believe in you, God, we might imagine that would be less hurtful, so to speak, if God has emotions, than someone who actually shames, um, shames another human. Okay, but how do we know this really matters in Jewish thought? It's nice to just say, okay, it's a theology, it's a theology, but how do we know it really matters? Well, in halacha, in Jewish tradition, look how it's concretized. It says in the Babylonian Talmud, Brachot 19b, so great is kavod habriot, so great is the dignity of human beings that it displaces a lo ta'ase. It displaces a prohibition in the Torah. That is to say, if there is a prohibition in the Torah, we can... Um, uh, the, the, the notion of kavod habriot outweighs it. If there was a conflict in a moment of what to do, it, it, it outweighs it. That, that's a pretty radical idea. And the way we know if something really matters in Jewish tradition is to see if it beats something else out. Like to give an obvious example of beating something out, your Rabbi Yisrael Salanter during a famine, because most people during a, not during a famine, during, a, during, an, during an illness, a pandemic, if you will, um, most reasonable people understand that you take pandemic seriously, right? Like you do basic precautions, right? Fill in the blank. And so in, in, you, you may have heard in Brooklyn uh, two days ago, you may have heard in Brooklyn these horrible protests in the Haredi population around a mask burning protest. And they created a mob, the, the ultra Orthodox Jews over there, and they, uh, they actually beat a guy unconscious. There was, there was a Hasidic Jew who said, you're wrong. We've got to wear these masks. This is not anti-Semitism. This is, uh, this is basic, uh, um, this is basic uh, uh, responsibility. Pikuach nefesh. It's saving a life. It was a Hasidic Jew, and they beat the guy unconscious. And then they attacked the journalist. They attacked the journalist. I mean, the insanity of it. The, the rejection of the science that was in, that's involved over there. And so, um, and so Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, it's Yom Kippur, and he said, look, everybody's got to eat. It's a public health crisis this year. You got to eat on Yom Kippur. And he, he said, I don't just want to say it. He stood up in front of the congregation and ate food in front of them to, to show them, to show them. And that shows you that, yeah, Yom Kippur, really, really serious, really, really serious, but saving a life more serious. And so and we're going to publicly demonstrate that. So two, okay, a prohibition in the Torah, really serious. Kavod Abriot, honoring human dignity, it's going to outweigh it. It's good. Oh, wait. Okay. Going on in Brachot 28b, here's a story in Agadah. When Rabbi Eliezer fell ill, he was sick, his disciples went to visit him. They said to him, Master, teach us the paths of life so that we may through them win the life of the future world. He said to them, be solicitous for the honor of your colleagues, and in this way you will win the, the, you will win the future world. So what Rabbi Eliezer is saying um, and, and the end of life over there, you could imagine a thousand different answers you could have given. They're saying, you're about to die, right? What really matters? And he says on his deathbed, the great sage, Rabbi Elzer, it is the honor of your colleagues. It is the honor, it, it is the honor of another that is involved here. Now, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, um, 
who was the grandson of Rabbi Reb Chaim of Brisk, and um, the brother of who we call the Rav, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who was at Yeshiva University. Um, uh, his yard site was on Tuesday. That was the commemoration of his passing in 2001. So I guess it was his 19th yard site. And here's what he wrote. I shared this with some folks earlier this week, but here's what he writes over here. As we get into the issue of race and gender and the like, from the standpoint of the Torah, there can be no distinction between one human being and another on the basis of race or color. Any discrimination shown to a human being on account of the color of his or her skin constitutes loathsome barbarity. It must be conceded that the Torah recognizes a distinction between a Jew and a non-Jew. He says, okay, we believe in differences, right? People are different. A man is different than a woman in some way. A Jew is different than a Gentile in some way, not essentially, but in our, in our life. This distinction, he, and he goes on and he says, what ultimately matters is Jews are, are not, God forbid, superior to Gentiles. Rather, the difference is in these moral responsibilities we take upon ourselves. There's a kedusha, there's a holiness to that. And so he goes on to say that this human dignity is not just for people like us, right? It's not just for people like us. It's actually for people who aren't exactly like us too. This requires the empathy to say someone different than me also has an equal level of human dignity. Now, just to remind us of Yitz Greenberg's teaching um, around, set around the image of God, he says there's three dimensions to that, right? Um, there is equality. That's the one people point to most, right? Then there is um, dignity. But then the one that we talked the least about, then there is uniqueness, right? What means a person is created in the image of God are those three unique dimensions, that all people are equal because they all have this, that all have dignity um, because of this, and thirdly, that each is unique. Now, we might thought because of the uniqueness that we, all, we aren't equal. Well, if we're unique, this one's a little smarter. This one's a little more funny, right? This one's got more wealth. Okay, so let's treat the wealthy one with a lot of dignity, right? The poor one, not so much, right? This one really is handsome or beautiful. Let's treat them with a lot of dignity and respect. This one, kind of ugly, let's not respect them so much, right? So, so we make clear the uniqueness is really important that all of us are different. We have different gifts and talents, but the equality is still there. And also let's make clear, lest we fall into some kind of a communist idea, right? That the equality doesn't diminish the uniqueness. The notion that we're all equal doesn't mean that we don't have a unique path of what we can cultivate in our lives. Um, and so, um, and so uh, that is uh, yeah, one thing I want to say over there. Now, let me, ask, let me say another thing. It's, it says over here in a Midrash that it asks the question, I love to tell this source, so excuse me if you've heard this before, that it says in, in the Midrash, what is the most important verse in the Torah? And the first answer given is Shema Yisrael, right? Monotheism. There's one God. Okay, good answer. Second answer, via hafta the Reacha Kamocha. You should love your fellow like yourself. Very nice. Okay, the, 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 there's Judaism, ethical monotheism. The first one, one God. The second one, treat people well. The third answer is brilliant because it says all people are created but Salam Elohim in the image of God. And it combines the first two. It posits there is a God. And because there's a God, that godliness is with inside the human being. And thus, um, and thus we have a, uh, a moral responsibility to others. But then the fourth verse, the fourth verse that's suggested, and it's the one that wins, is suggested by Ben Pazi. Ben Pazi says, you should bring your sacrifice in the morning. You should bring your sacrifice in the afternoon. And what's so amazing about that is the winning verse um, is that the idea here that if we believe in human dignity, the question becomes, what am I willing to do for that? What am I willing to do with that belief? It's not a bumper sticker. It's not a social media post. It's not a theology or a faith. How, what it was the sacrifice I bring into the world every morning? And what's the offering I bring in the afternoon? How do I make manifest in the world my belief that humans have, have dignity, have an infinite value and worth to them? So, that, so that's a profound question we might sit with a little bit of, of, of how we live that. And it's, and it's even harder when it's challenging. Um, I'll give you an, uh, an example for myself. This morning, I had to take our two foster kids to, uh, to get some shots, and the doctor's office was just packed. It literally took two hours, took two hours. And, uh, the, you know, and the kids were just going crazy or wild. And um, to be honest, I don't, uh, I don't 
have a have a deep love for these kids yet. Um, you know, they're not like my biological kids where I have a deep, deep love. I have a, a responsibility for them. You know, I care about them. But, uh, you know, there were moments that were really trying with them. And, uh, but then I had a moment of looking at them and saying, you know what, this child is created in human dignity like every other child. And just because they're not my biological child, right, there's someone, someone needs to take responsibility in the world for them. And, um, and that's, when it's, that's when it's challenging, when our patience is tried, when we don't feel a love for someone, and yet we're in a moment where we have to serve. We have to serve anyways. We all have these moments where we have to restrain our, our instincts uh, to, to be sure to honor the dignity of another. Perhaps for you, it's also trying in customer service. You've been on hold for an hour. You say, geez, Louise. <laughs> I, I think my, I'm either my uncle or my grandmother used to say that. Geez, Louise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, you've, got, uh, you, you've been on hold for an hour. The person doesn't know anything. They, and then they drop the call. They drop the call after, oh my goodness, you got to start the call all over, right? Now, the first thing I say, I said, write my number down. And so if you drop the call, you're going to call me, I'm sure, you know, but th th that's where you're, that, that's where we're tested. Customer service, you know, do we see the, uh, the human dignity in such people? As they say, more than anything you teach your child, uh, they, they are listening to you when you're on your customer service phone call. You know? so, um, okay, here's what Martin Luther King Jr. says. I look forward confidently to the day when all who work for a living will be one with no thought to their separateness as Negroes, Jews, MLK love to talk about Jews, Negroes, Jews, Italians, or any other distinctions. This will be the day when we bring into full realization the American dream, a dream yet unfulfilled, a dream of equality, of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed, a dream of a land where men, he spoke more about men than women, but that was the way people spoke philosophically, but there's a lot more to say about that, where men will not take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. A dream of a land where men will not argue that the color of a man's skin determines the content of his character. A dream of a nation where our, all our gifts and resources are held not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service for the rest of humanity. The dream of a country where every man will respect the dignity and worth of the human personality. So, so um, this, this plays out in all realms. It has to do with beauty, it has to do with wealth, it has to do with gender, it has to do with race, it has to do with, um, uh, with the self, because it, perhaps the biggest problem of all is self-respect, right? Kavod habriyot, human dignity, that someone carries that themselves, right? To truly look in the mirror and rather than see our regrets and our imperfections, to see the image of God in the mirror, not in a way that, that gives birth to some arrogance or entitlement, but to a responsibility, to a love that then can channel over to others. It's been, it's been said many times before that those who don't hold self-love are some of the most dangerous people in terms of how they can treat others. Um, okay, so what's the test case? Here's, the, here's, a, here's a big question, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure we'll come back to this later. Can you lose your tzelem elokim? Can you lose your image of God? Can you lose it? What if you're just a horrible human being? You're just a horrible human being. And so, um, and, and, and here's a related question. What's up with all those lawyers who defend, uh, who defend these you know, rapists and whatever, they, the right to the fair trial, right? What do we believe in, in terms of a judicial system of, uh, of rights? You know, and um, what do we believe in terms of what prison should look like for people who have, done, who have been found guilty of horrible things? Now here's what it says in Deuteronomy 21:23. The one convicted of murder has to be buried very quickly. That's the halakha. You have to bury them as fast as you can. Why? Because they're also created in the image of God. Which is to say that even the one who has done something horrific is still to have a proper burial and, um, and for it to happen as quickly as possible. Now, we do see in Jewish thought the idea that one can diminish the divine character of the human self. Maimonides writes about this in Hilchot Teshuvah 8.1, that if one, in, if one cultivates their virtues and diminishes their vices, they become more godly. And one who does the opposite doesn't work on becoming more merciful and more kind and more charitable and more giving and more loving and doesn't, and doesn't work to restrain their impatience and their entitlement and their, their, um, their gluttony and their waste and whatever the case is. They just live recklessly. Um, 
that they um, that the latter actually becomes less godly. Nonetheless, the rabbis say, based on that verse in Devarim and Deuteronomy, even someone who has done horrible things has an element of godliness that can't be removed. Now, this is a big idea, a complicated idea, and it plays out in some complicated ways in terms of what the implications would be for this. How do we view our enemy? How do we view our enemy? Um, so let me give a... Uh, let, 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 let me give an example of how this played out. I was involved in a conversation 20 years ago. I, I, I mentioned this case, so maybe you've heard me mention this before, where there was a really bad earthquake in Iran. If you Google it, you'll see the number. Something like tens of thousands of people, I don't know if tens of thousands were injured or tens of thousands died. It was like, like just this incredibly horrific earthquake in Iran. And the American Jewish community, as we always do after natural disasters, tsunamis and the like, um, raised money, raised money. And the Iranian government turned down the money. Jews, we don't want your money. Jews, you, you, you think we need your money? And so now the board had an issue. They said, we have two options. We could say, you don't want our money, forget you. We'll take our money somewhere else. Or we could give it covertly through a back channel and hide that it was Jewish money. Now, one side said, forget you. We don't need you. And the other side said, you know what, what matters more than what they think of us is the fact that those victims need the help and they're created in the image of God as well. Now, um, it's an interesting debate um, and it's something to think about here. Now, here's what I, here's what I will argue. Um, what I would argue is that one can lose their social dignity, although they can't lose their human dignity. Now, what does that mean? If, you've, if you um, are found guilty of certain crimes, you lose rights, right? You lose the right to operate normally in society. If you're Bernie, Bernie Madoff or you're you know, a killer or someone else, someone who has created harms has been found guilty, you have to serve your time. Okay, you don't have the right to, to you know, you have to go to jail. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, um, you have, there's, a, there's a criminal justice system in place. Okay, but because, even while you've lost your social dignity, you've lost certain societal rights, there's a human dignity you can't lose. And so I would argue, and I, I welcome pushback when we get to the conversation, that, that that means there's limits in terms of how our punitive justice system operates. And one of those limits I would suggest would be torture, that you can't torture or inflict cruel punishment upon someone even who has been found guilty um, because there is still a human dignity in place there. Um, okay, now, um, one, of my, one of my teachers, Rabbi Avi Weiss, in his book on the principles of spiritual activism, one of the principles of activism he lays out is that you don't demonize the opposition. You don't demonize the opposition. That um, you can disagree, you can fight fiercely against the opposition politically, morally, but you don't demonize. And, and something I want to say here, and I think this will be an unpopular thing to say, but I, it really irks me, and so I want to say it anyways. Um, I just can't stand petty political discourse. I literally can't stand it. If you disagree with something, fight on the, on the values. Fight on the policy. There are some politicians that um, it's probably no secret I'm not a very big fan of. Um, but do we need to talk about their bodies, right? Is the obsession about a fly in someone's white hair is the obsession about the size of one's hands? Is the obsession about someone the color, someone's red hair or someone being overweight? I think we're better than that. And so I think if we really dislike a politician, what they stand for, then we, we organize people to vote. We argue for policies. We argue for values. We debate. We debate. But we don't fall into the pettiness of, of, of belittling and demonizing uh, people that even if we fiercely disagree with them. And I think that this is one of the areas where Jewish wisdom can inform social change work. Because a lot of social change work operates, whether it's on the right or the left, with the idea that what matters most is you win, right? It's the, it's the consequence, it's the end result. How you get there doesn't matter as much. Ah, you could cheat a little, you could be corrupt a little, you can demonize, as long as you win, right? And I think this is kind of gross. I think this is kind of gross, and I think that part of what Judaism offers us here is that, yeah, the world is really messy, and sometimes if you, wanna, if you want to bring light into the world, you got to go into the darkness. If you want to clean up the world, you got to get into the mud, right? But how do you not muddy yourself in that? How do you not bring the darkness into your soul when you go into that darkness as well? How do you keep the light of dignity in place 
even while you are fighting robustly for what is good. Um, and so, um, and so you, so I'm arguing, and I, and I'd like to hear your feedback on this point as later that you can lose your social dignity, but you can't lose your, um, uh, you can't lose your human dignity. Now, um, okay, moving on here, I want to share two Rav Cook stories. Rav Cook stories. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Rav Cook. Um, our son is named Mayor Lev Cook. <laughs> uh, we, we love Rav Cook. So here's two stories about him. He was speaking at an event in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And one of his biggest detractors, Rav Amram Blau, who was a part of the, the Ture Karta. You know the Ture Karta? They are the <laughs> Satmer Hasidic Jews who meet with the Iranian regime to destroy Israel. Because they say you can't, move, you can't um, have a sovereign state until uh, Messiah comes. And so secular Jews have jumped the gun and started to have a state without the, the nod of the Messiah, of Mashiach. And so they are holding back the Messianic era. So Israel should be destroyed. Hasidic Jews! Hasidic Jews! So Rabbi Amram Blau was a Naturi Karta Jew. And, um, and he came to a Rabbi Cook lecture. Rabbi Cook was a big Zionist as, as um, you know, um, moved, he made Aliyah and became the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of Israel. And during Rav Cook's talk, his lecture, a thousand people, Amram Blau stood up, you wicked man, sit down. He wouldn't let him speak. He wouldn't let him speak. He disrupted everything he said. And so the police dragged him out. Now, of course, this is pre-state Israel. So this is, Brit this is British police. Um, the Jews didn't have the sovereignty or the right to police themselves in the land. So, th so th this was British mandate, uh, British mandate Palestine and their police forces. And so uh, they started to drag him out. And Rav Cook stopped his lecture and went over to the police car and said, I will not continue my lecture until you let this man go. So you let this man go. And so he said, I don't care how bad he disses me or disrespects me. The disrespect on me has no bearing on how I would still advocate for, for him. Um, here's another case where he does something similar. He does something similar. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Eddie. Go after the concept, not the person. And Judy, go after the behavior, not the person. Um, Rav Cook said, Rav Cook, uh, there was a guy who uh, was another detractor of his. He would pour garbage on his head when he would walk to, to his office each day. And that guy who would pour garbage on his head got sick one day and needed a medical procedure that only a doctor in London knew how to perform. And um, the tzaddik of Yerushalayim, Rabbi Arya Levin, came to Rav Cook and said, listen, you won't believe this. That guy who has hurt you, has dissed you, has embarrassed you, has ruined your clothes day after day. Uh, is, is going to die if he doesn't get this medical procedure. And you're the only one who has connection to the doctor. Will you help? Immediately, Rav Cook wrote the letter, said, please send it, get him there right away to this doctor. And then he called the Tzadik of Yerushalayim back and he said, give him this money so he can afford the travel to get to London. He said, I don't care if this guy dissed me. This is a guy whose life is at stake. His human dignity is at stake. I will fight for him. I will fight for him. Now, this doesn't only play out in large ways like that. This also plays out in some small ways. I'm reminded of a story of um, a, a guest arrives at the rabbi's house, and uh, at, at sitting at the table, he knocks over his kiddush cup. Um, because in Hasidic circles, you may know, uh, um, every, uh, everybody makes their own kiddush. It's not just one person says Kiddush at the front of the table, then everyone drinks. Everyone goes around and makes their own one. So this person so had their own Kiddush cup already, and they knocked it over. And the rabbi, seeing that this person immediately got embarrassed, knocked over his Kiddush cup. Said, oh, I knocked over my Kiddush cup, calling more attention to his spilled Kiddush cup to not, uh, not embarrass this person over there. And so oh, this reminds me of another story. I was in a coffee shop two years ago. <laughs> I was in a coffee shop. And um, I always take off the lid of my, of my coffee. Oh, I miss sitting in a coffee shop. Uh, but I, I, I take off the lid of my coffee. I don't know why. But um, I, I, I just, I don't like to drink out of that little hole, you know? So I don't know. I'm giving you too much information. You don't care what, how I drink my coffee. And anyways, so I have the lid off. And I go and I knock the whole coffee on the guy's laptop next to me. I, I'm, uh, I can't believe it. I'm freaking out. I'm so sorry. I apologize a million times to this guy. A million times, I can't believe it. I, I brought you. The guy doesn't even look at his laptop. He looks at me in the eye and he goes, Brother, it's all good. It's all good, brother. 
I walk away from the guy. I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy's my teacher. Who is this guy? This is like an angel. This is like, this is the Mashiach. I never knew what the Mashiach would look like. Oh, here it is. I go over to the, the coffee shop worker. I say, you won't believe this guy. I just knock over a whole coffee over his laptop. He doesn't even know if it's okay yet. And he says, brother, it's all good. She says to me, oh, that guy? He's also in the God business, just like you. I said, what do you know about me? <laughs> she says, oh, we listen to all your conversations over here. We know you're a rabbi. That guy's a pastor down the road. <laughs> I, go, I go back to the guy. Now he's, a, now he's a friend. I see him all the time. Thankfully, his laptop was okay. But in that moment, in that moment, this guy, instead of running out of his car, hey, you just rear-ended me. Who the heck are you? You know, it's, you just spilled as, a, right, as most of us would do. I certainly would do. I'd be like, hey, what the heck, man? You know, instead, he said, he instinctively, instinctively said, the, the dignity of this person matters more than my laptop. I mean, it, it's such a hard level to think about, such a high level to think about. Here's another case, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter was doing the tilat yadayim. He was washing his hands before motzi, before eating challah. And his students noticed that he used such little water. Why? He was like just dropping it on his fingers instead of using the whole cup. So he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, what are you doing? Such little water on your hand. He said, he said, uh, look, look out the window. What do you see? They said, nothing. There's just a guy out there. He said, yeah, but what's the guy doing? He said, oh, he's got a bucket. He said, he said this water here, we get it because that man walks up the hill to the well and fills up the bucket of water. I'm going to use as little as I can. So that guy doesn't have to walk up the hill in the cold weather out there, right? This is, this is the issue of the digging. Another story, Yisrael Salanter, the most famous one I love to tell, that he was asked to give Hashkacha certification to the matzah factory. And after inspecting it for, a, for hours, they said, no, will you give us your Hashkacha? The whole city is relying on this matzah for Pesach. He said, absolutely not. They said, what do we do wrong? Did we bake it too? We baked it. The, the, we baked the flour too long? Do we put too much water in? What did we do wrong? Was it more than 18 minutes, the requirement? So he said, no. You see those women back there making the matzah? They're overworked. They haven't had a break since I've been here. They're practically bleeding on the fingertips. This is not kosher matzah, right? The issue of seeing, of seeing the dignity of people behind. This is what we call you know, invisible people. Invisible people, the people who are not seen that we help others to see right? The cries that aren't heard that we help others to, to hear. You know, there, there was an embarrassing moment for me a few years ago where someone came over for Shabbat dinner and they noticed that our challah wasn't covered. You know, what, uh, what's the reason you tell a child or you tell anybody really, because it's the most common answer as to why we cover our challah? We say, oh, we don't want to embarrass the challah. What? You don't want to embarrass the challah? Like, what do you mean? The challah's got feelings? Say, so normally you say motzi, before you make a, a blessing on a drink, but on Friday night, you say your kiddush, you say the blessing over the wine before you say the blessing over the bread. So the bread might be embarrassed that, that, that the bread isn't prioritized. Might think, oh, you're making kish before me. What, what you don't like bread anymore? Or you're, making, you're dissing the bread? So, so you cover the challah so it can't see the first blessing you're making, so it's not embarrassed. So someone comes over and they say, Rabbi, you forgot the challah cover. The, you, you know, I want, I want, you got to put the challah cover on. You must not know the customer or something, or you forgot. I say, no, no, I'm intentionally keeping it uncovered tonight. So what did you do? He said, 10 minutes before you got here, I was, uh, I was impatient and jumpy with, with my wife. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I knew the guests are going to be here in 10 minutes. We're not ready. Uh, right? I, 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 I probably embarrassed her. I, I, I wasn't kind to her. I'm going to be so pious that in front of my guests, I'm going to be nervous about the dignity of the challah when I wasn't so nervous about the dignity of my wife. So I'm intentionally keeping it uncovered to, to, expose, to expose my lack of sensitivity. So, so, so uh, now, now I have this new level of having, I can only cover the challah if uh, I've done an okay job. Okay, one or two more quick stories, then I want to open up the conversation here. This one I just heard recently, and I, and I shared it once over the last, uh, 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 last month, so excuse me if you heard it already, but I just love this story. I love this story. So um, uh, there, was a, there was a wedding, and, a, and a, a young man runs over to the rabbi at the wedding and says, Rabbi, I became a teacher because of you. Because of you. you did? The rabbi says, because of me? I, I'm sorry, I, I don't recall your name. What's your name? You know, I, have I met you? And the student says, I was in your class. You were my Rebbe in school. I was in your class. He said, oh, great. It, was, it must have been a good class then. He said, no, no, I had nothing to do with the class. One day, something happened. One day, something happened. He said, what happened? He said, one day, a child ran in crying that someone stole his watch. Someone stole the kid's watch. And you know what you did, Rabbi? You closed the door. 
you closed the door and you said, you know what you said? You said, line up. No one is leaving the room until I have the watch back. Until someone hands over the watch, nobody's leaving. And uh, uh, Rabbi, my life was over. I was going to get kicked out of the school. My name was going to be defamed in our town. Right? My parents were going to kick me out of the house. My life was over. I'd never get a job. I was going to be, I, I don't know what was going to happen. But then you know what you said? You said, line up, everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. And when you pass me, I want you to drop the watch into my hand. And so uh, you saved me. Everybody closed their eyes. And when I dropped the watch into your hand, nobody else saw it. You preserved my dignity. And the rabbi said, but that was you? And the student said, yeah, of course you know it was me. I handed the watch to you. And the rabbi said, no, no, I also closed my eyes. I also closed my eyes. And so I love that story because the rabbi doesn't just try to save the student's dignity in front of the, the, the class, but also in his own eyes. For, him, for the student to know, I'm not going to judge you, right? We run around judging everyone. Let's judge each other a little less. And let's be a little bit more gentle with each other. Everyone needs second chances. I mean, that was what Yom Kippur was all about, that we all need uh, second chances. What happens when we stop treating people with dignity is when we treat them as acher. Acher means other. Other. How do you say responsibility in Hebrew? Achrayut. Achrayut is responsibility, which has acher inside of it. We fail our responsibility when we don't see acher inside achrayut, when we don't see the other as our responsibility. And, um, uh, and, and, and let me close with this Rabbi, Rabbi Harold Shulweis story. There's lots more to say, but I want to leave enough time to talk. There is Rabbi Harold Shulweis story of blessed memory who uh, was a conservative rabbi in, um, in Los Angeles, was a Holocaust survivor. And, um, uh, and, and here's, what, here's what Shulweis said. He said, I love this. And we, we, we've never seen the source inside any text. So I don't know if he saw something that most of us haven't seen or if he kind of translated something kind of liberally. Uh, um, but here's what he says. He says, the angels were very jealous when, when um, God gave the image of God to human being. The angels were very jealous. And so the angel said, let's hide this Selim Elohim, this image of God from the humans. And the first angel said, let's put it on the highest mountain. It'll take them centuries to climb all the way up there. And the next angel said, no, no, let's hide it on the bottom of the ocean. It'll take the millennia to get down there. And then the smartest angel emerged and said, no, no, let's hide the image of God in the depths of the human being because they'll never look there. They'll never look there. And indeed, friends, it's true. It's true that it is very easy to look at a person and not see um, that dignity that is inherent to them. And um, we see this in the pandemic in terms of how this country has treated seniors, how this country has treated seniors, that young uh, uh, Americans, teenagers, 20s, 30s, can be incredibly reckless. Why? Because they feel they're at lower risk. And um, the recklessness that can be shown to people who are of a higher risk population. What, because someone's older, they have any less dignity? I mean, it's, uh, this is the opposite of Jewish values, right? And the opposite of really any, any uh, value system of, uh, uh, that, that, that has integrity. And so um, Levinas and Buber fleshed out this idea of the human face. They said, believing in dignity is not some abstract lofty, lofty philosophy that you impose. It is in the human face. Buber said, in the eye thou, when you encounter someone, you see their face, it's when you experience it. Levinas said in a post-Holocaust era, right, the Germans, Heidegger, a brilliant philosopher, he was a Nazi. He was a brilliant philosopher who was a Nazi, and he said because he had these abstract, lofty ideas of ethics, he said we have to concretize it in the human face. You can't look someone in the face and shoot them because they're a Jew. You can't look a child at the border in the face and say, you know, throw them in a detention center for a year, or give them saltine crackers because, because they're not a citizen, right? You actually treat a person with dignity, right, because you see their face. Right, you see, you see their face, you see their gain. That, that's what Buber and Levinas flesh out. And the, the Romanov, the, the Rupchitzer Rebbe, says, actually, you see the name of God in the face. He says the eyes are, are the yuds, and the nose is the vav. And that together, if you put together, spells the aleph, which is the, 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 the letter of, of revelation. The Hasidic teachers say the only sound they heard of the Ten Commandments was that first aleph. Right? They didn't even hear the Ten Commandments. They heard just the Aleph, which is amazing because the Aleph makes no sound. 
it was a glottal, glottal stop. It was just like the sound of like air. The sound of air they heard was the revelation, right? Which is a remarkable thing. So the face is the revelation of God. And if we look in the eyes and see the nose of another human being, that's where we can see the, the letters of God, which spell the 26 letters of the name of God. And so we, we need to look no further than the human face. Now, interesting enough, the Torah says, God says to Moshe, to Moses, you can't see my face and live. You can only see my back. So we can't see the face of God directly, but we see the face of the human being, which is the closest we can get. The back of God, the rabbis say, is theodicy. Excuse me, the face is theodicy. Why do the good, why do the good suffer? Why do the evil prosper? That's the face of God. We're never going to know the answers to that, they say. The back of God is, is, uh, is a manifestation in this world. Okay, friends, let me pause here. Let me pause here. We have 15 minutes left for questions, thoughts, disagreements. I'd love to hear from you. So be sure to unmute yourself. We have a, a nice small group here so we can hear from whoever wants to share. Yes, Alan. Uh, you're still on mute. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, well, Rob, I thank you as thank always. You. I learned so much. I learned so much from you. And, thank you so uh, much. I don't always agree with you. Good, good. But I, I love learning. Um, <laughs> Good. I, I, Alan, I, would, I, would be, I would be very worried if you always agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's, one, of the item, one of the things you mentioned does bother me, and that is yeah. no matter how bad somebody is, they're, they're, they, their image is in <laughs> Selim al I knew you were going to say it. I knew you were going to say it. In Selim al him, and therefore, you didn't use the words, but I'll use your word. I'll use what I interpreted, you can excuse them. And I know you didn't use those words, but I can't do that. I can't excuse a Bernie Madoff who caused so much damage to his family, his, his you know, obviously his wife divorced him, one of his, oh, his name will oh, never, you Good. you're back, you're back. His, his name will never, um, you know, it's blotted from history and what he did to, both the Jewish community, well, the whole community, but specifically to the Jewish community is so unacceptable to me that he should not be excused. Same thing with, with um, not Nazi, the Nazis who specific, I'm not talking about the people who were Nazis but stayed at home and didn't talk up. I'm talking about the Nazis that um, killed, literally killed with their own hands, millions and millions of people, didn't care that they were children, didn't care that they were sick. They didn't care if they were young or old. I cannot excuse those kind of people. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, great. So let me share. Do you want to say anything else or can I respond? No, no, no. Please okay. Respond. The first thing I want, to, I want to make clear is that by saying I still believe that they are created in the image of God does in no way attempt to excuse anything they do or give any pass or give any moral relativism whatsoever. Evil is evil, straight up. And um, what I, what, what, um, my, my suggestion that they're, that they're still created in the image of God, um, I think uh, does, is, is two attempts. Um, and by the way, I think you have a valid position. I'm not looking um, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to uproot that for you, just to clarify my own position, um, which is that two things. One, I think it places moral limits on how we treat people. And if we're, not, if, if we're not interested in that for their sake, I think we could be interested in, in it for our own sake, right? Because the things that we will do to people that we deem evil, people will do to us if they deem us evil. If somebody really thinks um, Jews are, are wicked, um, we are Christ killers, we are you know, the capitalists who have destroyed the world and, can, and control all corruption, whatever they, they think as anti-Semites, then, um, then their countries will allow them to do things that as an international human rights standards, uh, we think we should do away with. And so part of my issue of doing away with torture not only is still a concern for the human dignity of a person who has done evil things, but also an attempt to make sure it doesn't get done wrongly to the, to the wrong people. That's the first thing I want to say, is kind of just like the moral implications. And the second is that I really do believe I really do believe, um, and you can push me on this more, that even people who have done horrible things have basically destroyed any moral justification for their existence in this world, still have something in them by virtue merely of the fact that, um, that they were divinely created. Um, and being divinely created means there's still some light in them um, that, uh, that holds back from them being irredeemable. 
And this emerges from the idea that any person can do teshuva. Anyone can repent and change their ways, even people who have done horrific things. And so um, I would be in the camp, um, and, and I, I, I encourage people to push back against me, who in all cases would oppose death penalty. Right, even in the in the in the in the Eichmann trials. I mean, the the one the one time that the state of Israel put someone to death, right? Um, okay, so let me pause there because it's it. I don't want to overstate my case, so I don't know if you want to respond again, Alan, yeah, or someone I, else. Yeah, Alan, go ahead. I yeah. do want to respond just real briefly, and that is in the Torah there are numerous numerous examples yeah. where. God does kill people. God does um, say, um, Sodom and Gomorrah and a lot of others where yeah. um, God encourages um, death for people who have, um, who have done evil. So yeah. I'm just saying that that's yeah. how I was, that's how I, I was taught the Torah. Yes, exactly. So I think if someone, if someone thought that the Torah itself spoke directly to our own um, moral and political moments, then I think that that would be a very strong case. Both the fact that the Torah sanctions death penalty, undeniably, and the fact that God, God's self, uh, kills people, uh, entire cities, um, does things like that. So I am of the camp that thinks that rabbinic tradition continues to reinterpret the Torah, and that is what is more binding for our moment. And so just as the rabbis did, basically did away with capital punishment by saying, one court in seven years, one court in 70 years that kills someone is a bloody court, basically doing it away and, um, and, um, and basically reinterprets those verses uh, in rabbinic Judaism uh, that, that I kind of hold by that approach. That's the first thing. And the second is that um, with, with no disrespect to God, I think that the God of the Torah is an immature God, by which I mean um, humanity was immature. Humanity was in an inf infantile stage, and so God acts the way you act with a child, right? Um, God openly punishes and rewards, right, the way you would with a young child. And in today's world where you can't directly see God, God treats us like, like adults. And so we don't, see, we don't see plagues. We don't see sp miracles of splitting of a sea. We don't see things like this. We don't see God destroying cities like that. I, I am offended by people who say, God created the pandemic upon us. God, uh, you know, did the earthquake, right? I find that personally offensive. And so um, I think that the God of the Torah is a very different God of today. Um, but Alan, I just, I, 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 I want to validate your approach. I think there is, there is plenty to say for the idea that, um, that Hitler should be killed. You know, Hitler has, has no dignity, no godliness to a person like that. And people of lesser degree as well. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my view. And I, and I think your view has grounding as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else? Just as... Uh... God can God, hide God's face from us. I think there are people who in, engage in burying God's face from themselves yeah, yeah. and who, who make it very hard mm -hmm. for other people to see God in them. Mm. But I figure if, if Jacob could see the face of God in his brother Esau, uh -huh. and, uh, then we probably should work a little harder and dig deeper to be able to look into others' eyes and see God. It's not always easy. And I, I understand Alan's point of view because um, someone has acted like an SOB, they're repressing the godliness that's in them mm -hmm. and have brought forward their Yetzirahara to the forefront. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I think that um, sometimes from from books I've read, and I'm curious if this is similar for other folks, what has enabled many people to change their path, they have said, was having someone who believed in them, a mentor or someone who saw that godliness in them. And th as, as folks know here, the recidivism rate in America is incredibly high, right? Those who leave prison as ex-felons, uh, who return back to prison. There's all kinds of explanations for such a complex phenomenon, but one of them is the difficulties of re-entering society and the barriers that are there. And one of the factors that has been shown to be very successful is to have someone who is there in their life 
who continues to believe in them in, in, when it's incredibly hard. And this is true in other things too, like battling illness or, or things like that. And addiction. so, I, battle, yeah, an addiction, that's right. And so um, uh, something that moved me as a child, unlike anything else that formed my thinking on this <laughs> was the bishop in scene two of Les Mis. The bishop in scene two of Les Mis, as I'm sure everyone here has seen, um, no, oh, you, Judy, you've never seen Les Mis? Oh, oh, okay, okay, great. You know, I was in your camp around, uh, what's that play everyone talks about now? Hamilton. I was in your camp in Hamilton until like two months ago when they made it free on Disney. <laughs> and then my wife and I finally saw Hamilton. And everyone was like, oh, everybody's seen Hamilton. I'm like, hello, I'm like, I don't have $2,000 to go see Hamilton, you know? <laughs> but um, now that I saw it, but anyways, with Les Mis, um, the, the Jean Valjean serves his decades in jail and, and he's a criminal. And back then it was like, you're a criminal for life. I mean, still like that, but it, you know, you're like a, a wicked person. And he spends the night in the bishop's house and in the middle of the night, he steals his stuff. And then, uh, don't worry, I'm not ruining the play or anything here. It's just, it's a scene two. And, and, and the bishop, um, the police arrive when he stole the bishop's stuff. And I, I, mean, I, I mean, I can sing every word for it, but, but you probably don't want to hear that right now, of this scene. And the bishop uh, t lies to the police and says, um, uh, no, I, I've, I've made this a gift to Valjean. Uh, this was a gift. He never stole this from me. And then he says to him, I bought your soul for God. That's how he ends his song. I bought your soul for God. And basically he saw the light in Valjean that he himself uh, didn't see anymore. And that is, that, is, that, is, that is his transformation moment where he says, I'm going to change my life. Uh, he has a, um, and I'll come to his second transformation moment in a moment. But he basically says that the bishop saw something in him that he himself didn't see in redeeming him. And he gives over his life to God, he says. And then the second scene is when there's a guy who's to be put to death because he looks like Valjean. And he jumps into the courtroom and gives up the life he's now, he's now become a mayor and a prestigious person. And he gives up that life to be a person on the run again um, in order to save that person's life when he realizes the integrity he's ultimately about. And so I think you're, you're right, Judy, that people, uh, it's been so hidden from themselves. And so the role of a teacher, the role of a mentor, um, the role that we play in various capacities in our life to, to see the good in people that they themselves don't see. The role of a parent. There's this, there's this book we read our kids, which I love, about monsters, about how the little boy becomes a monster, but his mommy always sees past the monster. She sees, she sees her little boy behind the monster. And, um, and eventually that monster fades away and his face comes back. And how the reason he's able to come back is because his mother looks at him as, as that sweet little boy inside, not the monster he's acting like right? <laughs> and so I always cry when I read that, that book to our kids. Uh, in any case, um, um, I, I think both these truths are true. This, this truth that um, uh, what Alan is saying here, um, and also what, what Judy is saying here. Um, okay, we have time for one more person. Okay, friends, I wish you an amazing day. I wish you a Shana a good year, a Chag Sameach, since we're still in Sukkot and approaching Simcha Torah. And as we approach Simcha Torah, I, I, I give us the blessing that the joy of Torah um, should not only be about Jewish particularism, Jewish continuity, but also the universalism of the Kavod HaBriot, that we see dignity uh, in others. Um, not only those we love, because the truth is we need to see more dignity in those we love, um, our children, our parents, our spouses, our siblings, um, because we can miss it there, but also in those we don't love yet, our colleagues, our, um, uh, our friends, uh, strangers, but also in people we disagree with, in people we disagree with or people we dislike. Let's bracket the philosophical question of people who are purely evil or mostly do evil acts in the world, but just to look at these, this other issue of what we can do practically in our, in our own lives. Um, and uh, the joy of the Torah should inspire us to, to not only live with that kavod briot, but concretize it in how we build our community and our society. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you, Julie. Not only educational, but very sensitive.
Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you so much.